This is John. John seems to attract all kinds of bad weather and natural disasters wherever he goes. See for yourself. One day, John notices his dog is restless. The pooch keeps scratching the entrance door and wandering around the house. He even tries to hide in the corner, howling and barking. When some mugs start to clink in your cupboard, John realizes what it means. The noise is produced by foreshocks, mini earthquakes leading up to the main event. Earthquakes often happen in clusters. After a few weak quakes, a much bigger one is likely to be on the way. Sometime before the disaster strikes, people might notice bizarre blue lights. Some of them seem to be coming out of the ground. Others are hovering in the air. These are earthquake lights. They may appear days or mere seconds before the ground starts shaking. Now, John is walking along the ocean shore. Suddenly, he sees the water retreat from the beach really, really fast. Uh-oh. John, run away as quickly as you can and find some high ground. A tsunami is coming. And your life might depend on how fast you react. If John spots a bizarre and unexpected rise in sea level, it can be another sign of an approaching tsunami. This happens in 40% of cases. The incoming water is the first tsunami wave. The second one, way, way larger, will come in in about 10 minutes. John can also notice seawater bubbling, swirling, and creating bizarre patterns. It's another sure sign a tsunami is near. Hmm. John feels there's something strange about the sun. Through his special super dark sunglasses, he sees that there's some uneven flares around the star's contour. If these bizarre rays are accompanied by auroras all over the world, they're a sign of a solar storm. Such storms are usually caused by disturbances in the sun's magnetic field. In this case, the bursts of gas and radiation on the surface of the sun get so massive and powerful that they can even reach our planet. Luckily, solar storms aren't really dangerous for people but they can mess with electricity and even cause blackouts. The sky over John's head is darkening and turning ominously green. Something hits him on the forehead. Ouch! He picks up the offending object. It's a hailstone, but it's not that cold outside and it's not raining. Soon, he hears some noise. It's approaching rapidly and turns into a loud roar. It sounds as if a freight train is moving towards him, but it's not a train, it's a tornado. The funnel isn't visible behind a cloud of debris, but John can't mistake this rotating column of air for anything else. Are you on the road, John? Then get as far away from your car as you can. Fast! Find a ditch, lie down in it, and cover your head. Oh, you're inside? Then get away from the windows and hide underground if possible. And please, John, be very careful if you spot some conically shaped clouds. Those mean severe storms. And if you notice that such a cloud starts spinning around, immediately search for shelter. The cloud is transitioning into a tornado right in front of your eyes. On the bright side, John should only worry about warm conical clouds. Cold ones are totally harmless. The only problem is to figure out the temperature of the cloud he sees. Duh! Ah, look. John just spotted some weirdly shaped trees. They look like the letter J and grow on a slope. It means the ground under John's feet is likely to be unstable. If he keeps wandering around, it can cause a bad landslide. Square waves appear when two different wave patterns crash into each other. This phenomenon does look kind of awesome. No, don't go into the water, John. Keep watching it from the shore. Cross currents in that spot can easily pull even a skilled swimmer under the surface. John keeps walking along the shore. At one point, he sees wild, choppy waves carrying ocean debris and seaweed. This time, he stays out of the water. He knows it can be a sign of a strong rip current. It can carry a swimmer far away into the ocean. How about a walk in the park? John likes this idea. The sun is shining and the sky is so blue and beautiful. Suddenly, he spots a rapidly growing vertical cloud. At first, it looks bright white. But as it approaches, alarmingly fast, it becomes dense and inky. The sky is darkening. It's getting windy. That's when the guy notices that his hair stands on end. It's his cue that he's about to get hit by lightning. At this very moment, positive charges are rising through his body. They're reaching towards the negatively charged part of the storm. If he doesn't react fast, these charges will meet. 
there's nowhere to hide, so John should crouch down and try to make himself smaller than the objects around him. Oh no, John, don't lie down on the ground. It may be damp and thus a great conductor of electricity. There are other signs that scream danger during a lightning storm. John's palms may begin to sweat. He might hear bizarre crackling and buzzing sounds coming from metal objects nearby. His skin can start tingling. There might be a strange metallic taste in his mouth. Plus, John is likely to smell chlorine. That's how ozone smells. Electrical charges split the molecules of nitrogen and oxygen, which are the main gases making up the atmosphere, into separate atoms. When these atoms come together again, some of them produce molecules made up of three oxygen atoms. That's ozone. We can smell it during a thunderstorm because downdrafts bring this gas from high altitudes to your level. Some bugs can feel a storm coming. They get ready for a natural disaster by freezing. So, when John notices that insects around him look drowsy, he knows to get ready. Oh, and bees can predict heavy rainstorms. These critters begin to work much harder the day before it starts raining. While walking next to the river during a period of heavy rains, John hears a roaring sound. He feels paralyzed with fear. It's likely to be a flash flood moving in his direction. Indeed, he soon sees debris coming down with the flow. The water is rapidly changing its color, becoming muddier and darker. Flash floods are very, very dangerous. Take care of your safety immediately, John. Another day, John sees a spectacular wall cloud. It seems to be stretching for up to five miles. In the best case scenario, it's just a severe storm coming. But if the wall cloud begins to move in a circle, it's a sure sign of a tornado. John is walking across a snowfield in the mountains, listening to the sounds the ice under his feet makes. The noise is kinda hollow. Hmm. Quickly check whether there are cracks around your footprints, John. If so, the chances are an avalanche is about to happen. Soon, John sees an avalanche moving in his direction. He does his best to get off the slope. In most cases, he could probably outrun it by heading downhill and then veering sideways, but not this time. He realizes he doesn't have enough time and heads for the nearest tree. If John keeps holding on to it really tightly, the avalanche might not pull him along. But if this doesn't work, he should try to swim up to the snow's surface while the avalanche is still moving. On a pretty nice summer evening, John notices leaves with soft stems droop all of a sudden. Ah, it might be because of an upcoming storm. Right before extreme weather arrives, the air usually becomes more humid. Leaves also get damp and heavy, and the wind easily flips them over. John lives in a pretty old house and is used to having cracks in the interior walls, but one day, he notices that some of them have widened. And look, there are a few new ones. It's an alarm bell. He lives in an area with loads of limestone, so new cracks can mean a sinkhole is about to open next to his house. John is hurrying home, trying not to waste time admiring shelf clouds. They look like something from a sci-fi movie. They form when warm and moist air gets caught in a thunderstorm updraft, and these ominous clouds most often mean a storm is coming. Okay, picture this. In the not-too-distant future, you're heading out on a space vacation, and you need to decide which items are worth bringing along. But instead of checking the weather forecast, you open a gravity simulator. That's because you need to know how each object will behave on different planets. For instance, should you take this metal shovel with you or not? Well, according to your itinerary, it's going to be a long, long trip. You're planning to visit every planet in the solar system and even a few moons. But due to the difference in gravity on these space bodies, you're not sure how useful some of the objects you're going to bring along will be. Well, let's start with the basics. Tupperware. I don't know about other space travelers, but us Earthlings carry our Tupperware around everywhere we go. And still, if you were to transport it to, let's say, Mercury, it would most likely fly away into the atmosphere. These plastic containers you use to keep your food are too light. And since the gravity on Mercury is two and a half times weaker as gravity on Earth, well, maybe you'll have to fill your plastic containers up before taking them out of your spaceship to have a picnic. If a Tupperware container weighs about a half a pound on Earth, it'll weigh just a quarter of that on Mercury. Now, if we add some bananas, a handful of baby carrots, and two watermelons, 
then it'll be safe to carry it out of your space vehicle. You'll just have some difficulty making it all fit in in a standard-sized container. But wait! Before you do that, you should know that the atmospheric temperature on Mercury can reach up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. This means that any plastic container will instantly melt as soon as it gets in contact with the air. It'll burn up all the food, too. You can probably try taking a titanium container, that will work, or just stick to astronaut food. Now, shall we say Venus? Okay, Venus. If you were to take the same empty container to Venus, it would behave similarly to how it does on Earth. This is because Venus is also known as our planet's twin. These two have much in common. For example, almost the same size and mass. And when the topic is gravity, the formula goes like this. The bigger the mass and the greater the density, the stronger the gravity. Venus's gravity is approximately 10% weaker than Earth's. So, yes, you may leave your spaceship with your container, empty or full, and enjoy a beautiful and scenic lunch on the surface of Venus. Now, you'll have to figure out a way to eat without taking your spacesuit off, though. The atmosphere of Venus is filled with sulfuric acid, which can irritate your nose and throat and cause difficulties in breathing. Or worse. Much worse. Now, you'll have to forget about taking anything too light outside on Phobos. A little hint for you, it's not a Greek island. Not even Greek yogurt, although it's a cool name. It's actually one of Mars's moons. Here, even your spacecraft would need a little extra help to keep close to the ground. If it weighed as much as a school bus, any regular-sized person could pick it up with just one hand. This is because on Phobos, the inhabitants of Earth barely feel the weight of gravity. And be very careful when jumping around, because one leap and you may fly straight into outer space. Uh, passengers on board the Voyager spaceship, please keep your arms and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Well, you're approaching Jupiter, a gas giant. A never-ending storm is raging in its atmosphere. Plus, there's no solid surface there, which means no landing for you on this planet. If you look out the window, it might seem that you are moving through a giant cloud. But for the purpose of your experiment, it'll work just fine. Try throwing into the air that baseball you brought along in case you get bored of all the space travel. And measure the time it'll take the ball to hit the surface. If on Earth, the ball will fall at a speed of 32,174 feet per second. On Jupiter, the same ball will hit the ground at a speed 2.5 times greater than that. That's because Jupiter is more than 10 times as large as Earth and around 300 times as heavy as our blue planet. Now, if you move your spaceship just a little bit to the side, to one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, the situation will be completely different. Throwing a baseball in the air on Europa will mean never seeing it again. Gravity there is almost non-existent, which means that not only a baseball, but even a grown-up person can fly away any second. Now, on the other hand, if you decided to venture out of the spacecraft to explore Europa's gravitational field, why not try to lift the space vehicle itself? On Europa, a regular Earthling can easily lift up to 1,000 pounds, which is the equivalent of a full-size male moose. <laughs> or you can lift a pyramid-like formation of nine regular people. Ah, the choice is yours. When approaching Saturn, be careful. While from afar, Saturn's rings look smooth and solid. From up close, you'll notice that they're made of chunks of ice and rocks floating in space. You won't want to have your spacecraft anywhere near those. There's also no solid surface on Saturn, which makes landing impossible. And the atmosphere is full of ammonia. Keep in mind that it's a pretty inhospitable environment for a human. Now inside the spaceship, you find a collection of sci-fi books, enough to fill an entire bookshelf. Altogether, they must weigh around 400 pounds. Yep, that many books. And like someone with a superpower, you try to lift over 200 pounds of weight at a time. But guess what? You fail! Because Saturn's gravity is too similar to that on Earth. Now in case you got confused with all this gravity talk, when we're measuring gravity, we're speaking about the power of the force by which a planet, or other space body, pulls objects toward its center. So if you need some help in organizing that sci-fi collection in alphabetical order, ask the crew to move the spaceship to a neighboring space body with a weaker gravitational pull. Like uh, Pluto. These days, it's not considered a planet anymore. 
just a dwarf planet and one of the furthest from the Sun's space bodies. You'll need an extra warm spacesuit to wear there. Pluto is freezing cold and has a tiny surface. It's smaller than Earth's moon. But it's a great place to test your strength. If on Earth it's kind of impossible for a regular person to lift an elephant, on Pluto, you'll be able to pick up a baby elephant weighing around 265 pounds. Or even a medium-sized elephant that can be as heavy as 2,000 pounds. On your way back to Earth, you make a pit stop on Uranus. The coldest planet in our solar system has an average temperature of around minus 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you attempt to get out of the spacecraft, you'll freeze mid-movement. Although gravity on Uranus is pretty similar to that on Earth, there's one thing that's very different – time. A two-week getaway on Earth turns into a three-year-long vacation on Uranus. Now, when you get sick of cold planets, you can travel back to warmer ones. Okay, now, Mars is definitely warmer than Uranus, but its average temperature is still about minus 81 degrees. On Earth, we only have such low temperatures at the South Pole during the winter. When you land on Mars, you'll start to feel light and strong at the same time. Mars's gravity is about 2.5 times weaker than that on Earth. So in other words, you'll probably manage to lift your own body weight without any difficulty. So all those handstands you've been dreaming of doing, you've found a place to fulfill your dream. About 8 billion inhabitants of planet Earth found out the same terrible news in one day. Someone saw it on TV. Others heard it on the phone while scrolling through social media or listening to music. Some witnessed this news in a dream while sleeping. Someone's voice said it in all languages to ensure everyone understood it. I have good news and bad news for you. Let's start with the bad news. You're all characters in YouTube videos in which your planet gets into a situation where the moon breaks in half. For the audience, it will be a hypothetical story, but for you, these events will become a reality. The good news is that I was joking. There is no good news. But don't worry, the apocalypse won't start on your planet. Maybe just a little bit. Have a nice day. At first, the entire population panics. Then, a few days later, everyone calms down. Maybe it was a mass hallucination, and the moon will be all right. But at this moment, scientists have discovered the danger. A colossal meteorite is flying towards us from the distant depths of space. This meteorite is super fast and pretty flat, but has sharp edges. Fortunately, it will miss the Earth by a few thousand miles, but the Moon won't be that lucky. The meteorite flies through our Earth's only natural satellite directly in the middle. So it passes through the Moon, sweeps past our planet, and flies away into distant space. At this moment, all people can't take their eyes off the Moon. The meteorite cuts it perfectly in half, gently, clearly, painlessly. So what shall we do now? Will the Earth survive this? Our satellite breaks into two equal parts, but fortunately, they don't fly away from each other. The Moon's great gravity attracts them back like a magnet. Scientists are sure that the parts will connect in a couple of billion years, and the Moon will become the same as it used to be. But the coolest thing is that people won't feel any changes. Everyone around the world will celebrate this good news. The voice was wrong. But then, another problem appears. A massive meteorite in the form of a shoe is flying from the deepest space to us. It enters our solar system and approaches the Earth at high speed. The space boot crashes into one half of the moon and then flies away. Now, the moon is definitely breaking into two parts. The first half remains in the same place. The second one is flying towards us. A small meteor shower begins on Earth because of the falling moon fragments. But it's not so bad. Most of these rocks are burning up in the atmosphere. But almost the entire split-off half is falling apart around the orbit of our planet. It forms a stone belt. Now the Earth is like Saturn. Rotating fragments destroy part of our artificial satellites. Communication and the internet work inconsistently. It takes people a couple of years to restore a stable connection. The International Space Station no longer exists. Luckily, all the astronauts managed to return to Earth before half the moon got to them. So, moon rocks are flying around the planet, and people see half the moon in the sky. Life doesn't change much for the first few days, but those who live on the coast of the seas and oceans notice the consequences. 
The moon used to influence the tides. It was flying around the Earth and made oceans take an oval shape. There were tides on the side where the moon was closer. There were ebbs on the opposite side. But now, this schedule is wrong. Half of the moon attracts less water. Yes, the moon lost half its weight and began approaching the Earth. But its gravitational force has become weaker. Seabirds, many species of fish, sea turtles, and other coastal animals may not survive these changes. Their natural instincts associated with the moon help them determine the time for getting food, breeding, and flying south. For example, tiny turtles expect a strong tide in the morning. They run to the water, but the water doesn't reach them. Turtles can't hide in the ocean in time and become dinner for seagulls. Crabs can't lay eggs because the tide has started earlier than usual. Wolves go mad in the woods. They howl loudly every night and can't stop. The whole natural world can't understand what's going on. The human body is also feeling some discomfort. Many people have low and high blood pressure, and some experience severe headaches. Half of the moon changes the entire ecosystem of the planet. Adapting to new conditions will take several tens, maybe hundreds of years. A couple of weeks pass, and people notice the days are now shorter. The moon always slowed the Earth's rotation and made one day last 24 hours. The Earth is spinning faster now. The night and the morning come earlier than everyone is used to. Earth rotation speed has increased and reduced the number of hours per day to 15. People suffer from insomnia or oversleeping. The body needs time to get used to it. Work schedules are changing all over the world. Previously, people came to the office at 9 and left at 6. Now, they arrive at 7 and leave at 2 p.m. Sleep time got shorter, and people are really sad because of this. Progress slows down because the short working time. The technologies of the future are now 20 to 30 years late. Hourly pay remains the same, so bosses now pay less for fewer working hours. The whole moon stabilized the weather and climate on the planet. Look at Mars. It has two small moons. They quickly spin around it and rock Mars around on its axis. As a result, strong winds, sandstorms, and thunderstorms often happen on the red planet. Now the half of the moon that approached us takes the Earth out of stable rotation. This changes the seasonal temperatures in the world. It even gets hotter in hot places. And snowstorms are raging in cold regions. There are short, massive downpours instead of sunny weather. A typical breeze can grow into a hurricane and small waves into a tsunami. The seasons are changing faster now. Winters are colder and summers are hotter. Changing the rotation of the planet affects the Earth's magnetic field. Since the compass and navigation systems are unstable now, we need to recalculate where the north and south are. Birds can't fly south to wait out the winter since they don't know what direction to fly. Their inner compass is broken. Several hundred years have passed. People are entirely accustomed to the new conditions on Earth. New species of animals and fish have appeared. Birds can navigate the sky by the moon again. The planet's economy has been restored. Hourly wages have become higher. People now get enough sleep from 5 to 6 hours a day and work for 4 to 5 hours. The reduction of day and night has also affected the entertainment industry. Movies now last one hour. One episode of some TV series lasts 30 minutes. Life goes faster. An average person now lives to be 96 years old. In fact, the passage of time hasn't changed at all. Its calculus did. Several thousand years have passed. People look different now. Now they have big eyes that absorb more light. Half of the moon doesn't shine as bright as the whole thing, so the nights have become darker. It took the human eye a couple of thousand years to develop the ability to see clearly in this new dark. Animals need to navigate better in these conditions, so their eyes have become larger and more sensitive. During all this time, people have cleared the orbit of moon rocks. Several space stations fly around our planet. And again, people hear this strange voice that once told them that they were all characters in one hypothetical YouTube video. This time, the voice says, Your story ends because the video ends. I'm sorry. Good night.